Dr. Bob Mosieni is a, a practice, practitioner in Maryland, and today he's going to share about medical innovations in the age of information. He is a rheumatologist with graduate and postgraduate physician scientist training from Albany Medical College, Yale University, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and the National Institutes of Health. He is presently in private practice in Bethesda, Maryland, where he specializes in chronic inflammatory diseases having rheumatic and neurovascular manifestations. Under an ongoing research collaboration with Dr. Breit Schwert, Dr. Mosieni maintains an observational clinical evaluation of the significance of Bartonella infection in a group of several hundred human patients with otherwise unexplained chronic conditions. Clinical correlations between Bartonella species and various conditions are being determined through ongoing research, which continues to redefine diagnostic and therapeutic options as dictated by clinical experience. And I'm sharing you that with, that with you. It is a mouthful, but I want you to understand that he is on the cutting edge of what is happening with infectious disease correlated with chronic inflammatory conditions. And he's also the co-author of the soon-to-be-released book, which is on pre-sale right now, called Lyme Savvy. And you can um, ask Sharon Rainey and Bob about that book more afterwards. So it's an amazing collaboration between the patient and doctor. Anyways, thank you so much for being here, Bob, and welcome to the conference. Please give him a warm welcome, round of applause. Good. Thank you, Robin. Uh, happy to be here. Um, I feel like I'm trying to compress about a billion bits of data into this short uh, time and to try to also make it uh, understandable and even actionable. Um, and just uh, briefly, um, I would I'd want to acknowledge all the patients who've really taught me more than I think I've taught them. And, and my job is to just listen and learn and then try to expand what I learn to apply to the care of other patients. So there are a variety of different topics I'm going to um, bring up today, but I want to give you guys a good idea and some specific examples of how this thing we call Lyme disease, or for that matter, any chronic condition, can actually break down into other things that you might not have uh, expected. So with that, next slide, please. Uh, in most medical conferences, in all medical conferences, we have to uh, disclose affiliations and so forth, and these days we also have to start disclosing if what we are saying is approved or not approved by the FDA, otherwise the attendees can't get CME credits. So that's beginning to influence and color what doctors are learning when they go to conferences where they get CME credits. I can change it from here. Yeah. There we go. Okay, so um, we... Um, if you look at the translational medicine timeline, it's quoted that it takes 17 to 21 years for, this, for an idea, a concept in medicine to make it into regular clinical use. That means that on average, the concepts that are used to treat you are at least 17 to 21 years old. Okay. And there's a lot that has to happen. Uh, and these days, although we spend a tremendous amount of money on research, we're literally paying people to, to incentivize them to continue to do research rather than to solve the problems. Now, in most cases, especially today with this huge amount of information that is now available, uh, we actually have solutions to many of these problems today, except you have to kind of reassemble the data in such a way that it becomes meaningful and applicable today. Now, that is possible, but every person who specializes in the field of medicine is focusing in their own little niche, doing their own little thing with all their knee-jerk reflexes that they've learned through their training process without the scientific framework to look sideways and integrate new information. But the information may well be there today, and I believe that what I see day to day is that the, the tools that we have there today are actually applicable and useful and successful. It's just a matter of reassembling how we look at things and pulling in the right data uh, but every time we try to do that, we're going to get slowed down by prior authorizations, insurance reimbursement, and medical boards. Now, just briefly, the phases of, of development and reimbursement are manifold, but you can see how it takes a long time and a lot has to happen, and it's very expensive, 
and there's a lot of human suffering that has to occur as we go from a theory to an outcome that confirms the, um, the approach. Now, you may all have heard about uh, levels of evidence. One of those uh, cited as the highest level of evidence is randomized controlled trials. And there certainly are new applications, uh, a new, a new, constant, new developments where this is relevant. But this is a new approach that was pioneered in several areas, but it's called Bayesian Adaptive Clinical Trials. And it's a much more efficient and streamlined approach to doing clinical trials. This approach is very expensive. This approach is really streamlined, and you can get really good data with many fewer subjects. The FDA actually has a, uh, a, a guidance document on developing and using Bayesian adaptive clinical trials. So it is something they accept, and I'm hoping that this will transform and accelerate this process of doing clinical trials. And I think at some point, this can actually be fused with the way we practice medicine. In other words, every person can be their own arm of an adaptive ongoing clinical study. Now, there are some uh, important differences between acute and chronic illness. Um, <clears throat> if you have an injury, the cause is clear, the injury is characterized, and the treatment is rendered, and you're out of it, hopefully. With chronic illness, we have a cascade of events that occurs. And in my opinion, this is why uh, you can't uh, expect a, a, a trial, for example, on Lyme disease with one antibiotic to treat people with chronic persistent Lyme. Because by that time, too many things have happened. There's a cascade of one event leading to four, leading to 20, et cetera, et cetera. And you literally have to put all those back in, put the genie back in the bottle before you can really uh, successfully treat the patient and even get to the root cause sometimes. Now, this concept of, is the disease the result of the bug versus the terrain? In other words, is it the germ? Or is it the person's response that manifests how the disease is, comes to present? And I think that in acute illness, uh, it's more the cause. But with chronic illness, I think it's more of the host response. So a lot of these chronic infections are not infectious diseases. They are host response diseases. And I think this is where some of where we look for expertise is misplaced because a host response disease is a result of many factors, your diet, your nutrition, your other stressors, your uh, genomic tendencies to certain manifestations of that process. And the disease can be so varied in the way it manifests that it can confuse your physician and it can confuse other people in your social network. And the temptation is to replicate what someone else has tried successfully for yourself, you know, but failing to recognize there's so much diversity in the host response. Now, if the pathogen factors are strong, for example, I used to use the example of Ebola, but even there we know that the host response determines whether you live or die. But there it's a really strong pathogen, but if you've got a weaker pathogen that just kind of, you know, it's like a, it's like a death by a thousand cuts, it just kind of slowly brings you down. It's more of a host response illness. And it'll manifest more in these other specialties of medicine than in infectious disease specialties. Now, chronic illness is counterintuitive also in that acute illness follows the principle of Occam's razor, find the simplest explanation for the problem and the simplest treatment. With chronic illness, the root cause expands and to many proximate causes of many symptoms with much overlap and it requires a whole new set of skills functional medicine, treating the root cause, and this is not endodontal therapy, this is just, you know, finding the original cause. It usually does not reverse symptoms when you take a narrow approach. And I would say that, for example, in chronic infections and Lyme disease, just giving antibiotics is usually not adequate. And therefore, the randomized controlled trials will fail to show benefit of antibiotics for persistent Lyme symptoms. Okay, so we can take a multi-system approach, uh, and we, we need to for chronic illness. Um, it's, and I tell patients they don't have 12 diagnoses. They can't be in 12 pigeonholes at the same time. They can only be in one, and that one is unique to them. It's a complete description of where that person is with regard to the process that they're in. 
So we have to manage the proximate causes of the disease. So if the disease leads to, say, sticky platelets and causes uh, sludging of blood flow, then uh, that's going to create some symptoms. So systems to consider, a lot of these are typically considered in functional medicine, uh, adrenal fatigue, inflammation, circulation, metabolism. I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about this one uh, and a few others. And hypothyroidism is a big deal. Clinically, most of these folks who have chronic symptoms have this, but the labs are normal. And they're normal because we're using uh, old technology labs, and there are better technology lab tests, but they're still not being used. So for free T4, free T3, it's a matter of using, um, using uh, LCMS methods, liquid chromatography, mass spectrometry methods. This is um, quoted from an email that, of uh, correspondence I had with the head of NIH clinical chemistry at the NIH, uh, Steve Solden. And basically, the bottom line is this. Um, if you measure, if you remeasure these tests by this method, and the total T3 and free T3s are low, patients clearly need T3 dosing. This is a very common need in chronic illness, and I rarely see a patient who's actually had this addressed properly. And when they do, they usually respond much more quickly. And it may be the low-hanging fruit, even pulling someone out of a very uh, difficult situation. Now, there are many different thyroid hormones. I won't get into all this, but there are enzymes that operate inside the cells, the, these diiodinase enzymes, 1, 2, and 3. And different tissues have different ones. But they result in this uh, balance of these are the different enzymes, iodinase, diiodinase type 1, type 2, type 3, and they cause in, inside your cells, which we can't easily measure, different proportions of T3 and reverse T3. And then both go to T2, get recycled back to the thyroid gland. So this is going on inside your cells, but we don't have tests for that. So we're limited in our technology. And we, we could, in theory, look at the genomic factors with these enzymes, but I don't know of a lab right now that I can order that test through. So we need to prioritize and focus what aspects of the chronic illness we go after first. For example, do we go after thyroid first or circulation? And we do that with uh, extensive clinical experience to help us prioritize what we do first. We need to track data. We need data, good data from the patient. Uh, one of my patients, it, it took me a year to get him to stop. He's, he had been sick so long, he started nicknaming his symptoms as BART symptoms or BAB symptoms. It took me over a year to get him to stop doing that and give me actual data of, how he, of what his symptoms were. Inflammation is not a symptom. Pain is a symptom. Fever is a symptom or a sign. But we need real good data directly from patients. And when you're sick, it's more important to record the data. And when one is sick, you tend to want to do less. Sure, do less, but do this more. So um, you may have all heard about all these different trends and buzzwords. Uh, big data is definitely coming your way, and it is here. And ultimately, the hope is that with machine learning, we can, have, we can take the bias out of what the interpretations are. Because right now, we're very um, prone to the human aspect of, of having opinions that are based on our out-of-date experiences. So this is a topic um, that has been uh, painful to me because it's painful to my patients. And so I spent some time trying to understand it. So in this era of online uh, activity, you know, everyone's got an opinion. It creates confusion and fear. It interferes with treatment. It takes up time. It's like a denial of service attack on the internet. And when a patient comes to me saying, what do you think about this? My first instinct is to prevent from blowing up, OK? Because what they've just done is put me in a spot where I either have to act or I have to appear that I'm dismissive, or I have to actually try to explain. So suddenly, they've taken up this precious time that I needed to get more of their information from them, more of their symptoms. And because we occasionally find a fantastic, often sometimes life-saving nugget of information, if you ask a psychologist, they'll tell you that irregular positive reinforcement is the most powerful enforcer of a, of a behavior. Okay, so be careful about this. There's some great stuff out there. I'm a real believer 
in the value of it. But I am trying to, I'm working on developing some, a, certain, a new kind of social network that's kind of filtered in a way to give you what you need. Um, so along those lines, I'd like to put out that one of the reasons we have a line controversy is that we have a medical definition, which is this germ. And then we have everything else, which I call hashtag line. Okay? And one thing I'll tell you is it's very, very often, maybe even most of the time, not Borrelia. Trust me on that. <laughs> so this is how I see this. So this is, this is very interesting here because this is the, the community of sick people innovating to find solutions. And this, so this is a powerful new modern way in the information era because this is becoming the new definition of the disease. All right, and a lot of the controversy is just simply because this is a medical definition. So when you talk to infectious disease specialists, they're concerned about this definition because that's what they need to define to, in order to do a clinical study. Clinical studies are very narrow. You choose your, your subjects very narrowly. Anyway, so this is, to me, it's a fascinating thing, and I, I embrace it, but, uh, you know, it's, it's new, and we all have to learn to adapt to it. So what's moving out of some of the newer technologies of microbe diagnostics uh, is antibody testing, because we can get false positive antibodies. When patients have active Bartonella, they will often have IgM to Borrelia. And what's more in are proteomics and genomics, and we're beginning to look at microbiomes. So instead of just looking at one germ, we're looking at the community of germs, and we're looking to see what sorts of DNA information are in that community not what germ is there, because they're all exchanging DNA. And recently in the news was a, a, a bacteriophage in a bacterium in the intestines of a black widow spider, and the virus was carrying black widow spider genes. Okay? So we need to stop thinking of the DNA as living in a particular corpuscle. It, it, it's pieces of information and code floating around resulting in certain things. But along with that, massive, massive data overload. This is a huge understatement. Okay, so the shift is now occurring from, from like just gathering the data in the lab. Like look at your, for example, on a 23andMe test. You have so much information, uh, you don't really know what to do with it. And so what's, it's, it's easy to get a lot of data now, but it's hard to know what to do. And words will be inadequate to assess this, uh, because if, if there is, you know, several billion base pairs in that word, it's really hard to pronounce. And the FDA, therefore, is beginning to be concerned about controlling lab-developed tests by enforcing meaningful use. So they want to show validity before they're going to allow it even to be used at all. This is of concern to me, because that means that it's going to quash innovations in diagnostic testing in a big way. So you may have heard this term lately, uh, and in part it's due to the fact that we're appreciating more the role of Bartonella in co-infections. And there is an overlap with Lyme disease, but this is its own gargantuan problem. And there are many more ways to get it than you can get from ticks. The single biggest one, unfortunately, are cats. Indoor outdoor cats catch rodents and they interact with small furry animals outside the house. And if they're indoor and outdoor, the odds that they're carrying Bartonella are almost, are, are very high. I won't quote a number, but they're very high. And Borrelia and Bartonella um, have common insect vectors, so there's definitely an overlap, and definitely Bartonella is and can be a co infection uh, of Borreliosis. Uh, and it does occur in association with Lyme, but it's especially prevalent, I think, when people have more neurological and neuropsychiatric findings. So a lot of what's called neurological Lyme, I actually think maybe Bartonella, protozoa, things that block blood flow to the small vessels of the brain. Okay, so a little bit about Bartonella. I'm gonna go kind of quickly here. Um, the many reservoirs for Bartonella. Uh, I find this history much, much, much more likely in Lyme patients than tick bite histories. And 
that's a flea. So you get cat scratch disease because the flea feces ends up under their nails and they inoculate your skin. The medical textbooks say it's a benign self-limiting disease of two weeks duration that might need antibiotics and then it's no big deal, it's gone. I can assure you that it's not gone. It may, you may be fine for five years or 10 years, but it's not gone. So this is from a published paper, Dehio et al. in Nature magazine. Uh, so uh, the CDC will tell you there's no proof that ticks can transmit Bartonella, nor mosquitoes. But these bacteria are really small, and if these guys can transmit protozoa, it's kind of logical that they might be able to transmit more than that. And it gets into the skin. We used to think it was strictly in the blood vessels, but it's, it can also be in the skin. And we've actually shown that on microscopy, that Bartonella does exist in the skin. So again, just basics from biting insects, local dermal phase, lymphatic phase. It can cause lymph node swelling, uh, vascular and blood component phase. It can be found in the bone marrow, it gets into bone marrow uh, cells, gets into dendritic cells uh, in, in the brain, glial cells, and it can cause chronic inflammation, which again, the degree of that is a host response. There are many people who get Bartonella chronically and they don't get sick. Now, into biofilms. Um, it's a lot of junk is in a biofilm. So people try to understand what it is, but it, there could be many different kinds. Dental plaque is a biofilm. And it's important because it can protect microbes from your immune system and antibiotics. So these are roughly the phases of development. Um, uh, you get a diffusion gradient to antibiotics. So if you try to treat, it doesn't penetrate, and there could be a thousand fold higher level of antibiotic needed to get into a germ that's here, okay? This is a very big deal, and uh, the first person to tell me it was a big deal was a uh, specialist in pharmacokinetics at the FDA who accompanied a patient of mine who worked at the FDA. And it's a big deal in cancer therapy as well as infection. Um, <clears throat> so the microbes can be in different phases also, so they may be very vulnerable to antibiotics in this area, but not in that area. And this is a small blood vessel. There are just a few red cells wide, but this is inflammation, fibrin deposits, and in there um, are bacteria that your immune system can't get to. And this will sludge the blood flow there, and if this vessel is feeding a muscle, you'll get a twitch. If it's feeding a nerve, you'll get numbness and tingling or pain. If it's feeding a part of your brain, you won't be able to think. If it's feeding some you know, part of your skin, you might get white blotches of, of poor blood flow. So here's a young guy uh, who had the worst biofilm I've ever seen, and he had all, and still has all the classical diagnostic features of PANDAS, which is thought to be a strep infection, but they haven't established causation with that. But in the PANDAS cases I see, I see lots of biofilm, and I see um, lots of also high, high likelihood of protozoa as well. This biofilm was so long, it was just one long strand, that it fit across two slides two frames on the microscope, and a lot of fragments over to the right in large view. You know, just more of that. Uh, another one from the same kid. And these are all the biofilm fragments in his blood smear. So when hematologists do blood smears, they ignore all this, and they've known that this has been there for eons, but they don't know what to make of it, so they call it debris and they ignore it. And microscopy is undergoing um, a rebirth because about 15 years ago, they got really good at polishing the lenses. And now with a regular light microscope, we can actually see inside red cells. And pretty soon in a year or two, uh, we can do confocal laser microscopy and see the fine microarchitecture in your red cells in a, in a simple laboratory. And we've had a CLIA approved lab now for a few years, so I've looked at tens of thousands of these images in patients. <clears throat> this same kid had a lot of platelet clumping as well. And this is a lady who had ALS. Um, her brother was my patient, thought she should come in, but these patients deteriorate so fast, I never really get a chance to do much with them or for them as soon as their breathing uh, is compromised they go out of my hands and they end up in the hospital. And it's a real struggle to try to keep them engaged. And also, if their version of a Herxheimer reaction 
is that they may, might become unable to breathe. So it's a kind of hurts that really, you know, can, can kill them. So they're very difficult. I, I'd say right now I think they're impossible to treat unless we get really good at dissolving. Now in this lady, this is a big clot. Uh, and this is the edge of the clot. So a lot of white cells in here, um, fibrin strands, red cells becoming part of the clot that's growing. So you can't see this, and it's the only time I've seen this has been in this one ALS patient. So you can't look at an ALS case if you look at the blood smear and see this. You can't look at it the same way, and you can't look at it from a standard of care point of view. This is a, a patient who had um, a lot of Bartonella. You can see it in the red cells, just under the surface of the red cell. <clears throat> and this is what often happens in folks is the neutrophils. Uh, there's one mechanism, neutrophils fight germs, that they just go, they just destroy themselves, they sacrifice themselves. So that's called netosis, or neutrophil extracellular trap. And this is the first step of the biofilm forming. This is nuclear DNA material. This is a published paper on Bartonella, so I just wanted to show you that others have identified Bartonella just under the surface of the red cell. This is a, a group in France that, that does that. So again, keep this picture in mind, because I, I think it's the proximate cause of many symptoms. And it's been implicated that biofilm really is art arteriosclerosis. So we cardiologists do believe uh, that arteriosclerosis is caused by chronic infection and inflammation. But right now, all they do is check a CRP and give you statins. All right, now statins are actually kind of antimicrobial, so there's, there's a plus side. Now, these small vessel problems affect the way the brain works, and uh, it can be anywhere throughout the vascular system. You can have symptoms, but uh, these are the mechanisms. And uh, again, really any symptom is possible, but people want to think that those symptoms are diagnostic, and they really aren't necessarily so. That there's just a, a variety of different ones that can always occur. And in the central nervous system, I think it can cause any neuropsychiatric symptom. Um, so there are different ways of figuring this out, but really it's to look at the brain and the nervous system as a very sophisticated and sensitive system of sensors and tripwires for the disease process. Um, it can cause, and often does cause, mild cognitive impairment. The inflammation also depletes uh, nutrients like uh, B vitamin factors, biopterin, etc. It's not a dementia. The working memory is impaired, and the processing speed is delayed. Mood is labile, um, and you may all be very familiar with these. It also explains, um, because of this delay and low bandwidth, people also often express rage because they can't process too much um, information, even a conversation that's too fast. And um, again, nerves are a really, a neurolo the neurological system is a good place to look for small vessel disease. Um, these are uh, all patients um, with Bartonella. This is a list of, of different cases summarized. Expressive aphasia, encephalitis, uh, transverse myelitis, this is um, spinal cord inflammation, et cetera. There are non-central nervous systems too, right? So it could be peripheral nerve. Longer nerves are affected first, so toes before fingers. Uh, autonomic dysregulation, and so on. Now, if they're microvascular, those tissues aren't dying. They can usually be recovered. And this is one of the key roles, I think, for hyperbaric oxygen. Most people use it to try to treat germs. It may be treating some microbes, um, but the data are practically non-existent. So I use hyperbaric oxygen as a healing modality. And if they, go, if they do fine, then I can increase the pressure and we might get some germ killing, but I don't think anyone really knows what germs are sensitive to oxygen among the Lyme and, and other co-infections. So I see it as a way to reduce inflammation. And there's some really new um, uses in this area, which again is another controversy. It looks a lot like Lyme disease, but just different actors. Now, in dogs, the frequency is much lower, and when it's there, their blood levels are lower than when cats get it. But these are the kinds of Bartonella they get. And so I think they're less likely to be infectious to us. And you can see the same kinds of phenomenon in a dog with Bartonella as you do with a human. So we can look to this as proof and evidence of causation. Um, there are some other disease manifestations, skin rashes, stria, dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system, hypothyroid. 
And again, I want to make this point. Um, when cats get it, their blood levels are almost a million fold higher per, per unit volume than when a human or dog gets it. So when a cat gets, gets burned, somehow they manage to be, to function with much higher levels of bacteria. And even the sickest cat, for a few days a month, you can't detect Bartonella in their blood. And this is why when we do blood cultures for Bartonella, you need to do more than one. You need to do a triple or more because there's a sampling error. It's like going fishing. This is why it's called fishing, not catching, right? So we've got to catch that Bartonella, and you've got to go fishing a lot for that to happen. Instructive case, 30-year-old veterinarian uh, with probable childhood and occupational exposure. Um, and she had all strains of Bartonella that we found DNA evidence for in the bloodstream. She also had a uh, fibrocystic breast disease, and the docs at Harvard uh, told her that it was benign. They refused to uh, take the fluid out and culture it, but uh, we did, and it was positive for Bartonella. I don't know if it caused it or just inoculated it. No antibodies at the beginning of treatment. That's really important. And Bartonella, most half of the patients will not have antibodies and that's if you do a good test. But the tests that are out there that most labs offer is not sensitive enough to pick up antibody to Bartonella, even in this phase. So people are getting tested, they're negative. So, you know, and we have a law in Virginia that you can't tell a patient they don't have Lyme when the test is negative. Same should be true of these other infections. And after treatment, the antibody surged, and then it disappeared for a while again, and then it came up a little bit, and then it went away. With some patients, I think it keeps going up after treatment's over. This is from a study we did, which really uh, was the reason Galaxy Diagnostics came to exist. Um, but most of these patients were post-Lyme uh, treatment. And I've been over some of this. I'll speed up. But a third of those patients um, reported, these are patient reports, they reported uh, having Lyme disease. Half of them reported psychiatric disorders, and most of them reported, of those who had neurological disorders, most um, were positive for Bartonella. Uh, you can't use any one method, so we, we look at blood culture and serum, and this is enrichment culture, serum, and blood by PCR. So PCR here, PCR there, enrichment culture, then PCR. And you can see that no single method captures uh, provides the answer. So when we do a triple culture, each specimen is tested three ways. So nine tests on a triple culture. Um, it can and has been transmitted vertically um, from mother to child. This was a published um, uh, family case report, which was kind of tragic in some ways. Um, and, but in my practice, I've had multiple people have pregnancies, and when we test the cord blood, they've, all the kids, thankfully, have been negative. And as far as I know, they're all fine. So I think Barnell's pretty common, and there's some innate, we have biologic with some innate ability to function with it. And people have remarked that stria may be related. We're studying that hard with Martin Erickson at University of Minnesota. We're not really sure yet, but we, we do. You can see Barnella in normal skin if it's biopsy, let alone the stria. Uh, and it may confuse Borrelia detection because A, Bartonella is immune suppressive. You get a surge of antibody during treatment, and the IgM response is not specific. So any active infection is going to generate a lot of IgM, and you're going to see a lot of IgM positivity on other tests, including Lyme Western blots. So this is a summary I haven't published yet of our patients who we've published in the CDC's Emerging Infectious, Infectious Disease Journal. But I looked at whether or not they were like the ratio of IgM to IgG positivity in the Western blots for Lyme in Bartonella patients. And if they're PCR positive for Lyme and antibody, I'm sorry, Bartonella, and antibody positive for Bartonella, then the risk, they're 1.4 times more likely to have IgM than IgG. And if they were PCR positive but antibody negative for Bartonella, they were 2.8 times more likely to have IgM. So IgM positivity without IgG might not be Borrelia probably is in Borrelia. You can't really be sure unless you follow that and see if it changes with treatment. So we're going to do this registry to try to get more data, try to understand the problem better. And uh, these are some resources that you might want to consider if you want to learn more about Bartonella. A big uh, reference database on Galaxy's website. And I recommend a testing protocol, et cetera. And uh, there's a nice summary of, of 
Bartonella activity in this Townsend letter. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.